Good afternoon, everybody. Thanks for coming out this afternoon. It's my pleasure to uh, introduce you and welcome you here to the lab uh, Vice Admiral Ted Carter, who is the 62nd Superintendent of the Naval Academy. Rather uniquely, he is also a former president of the Naval War College. He was the 54th president of War College. I did some research, Admiral. You're the second in the last century that, that held both of those positions. Admiral Carter is going to talk to us about uh, building leaders of consequence. He's also going to share with us some of his views on the world. Uh, but he is very well positioned to do that. Uh, many of you have a naval background will recognize the Vice Admiral Stockdale Award. Admiral Carter is a recipient. Also the Navy League's John Paul Jones Award for Leadership. Uh, he, he's lived it, uh, and he is a combat uh, naval aviator, a uh, decorated combat naval aviator. He understands what it takes to do that under pressure. And he um, really, uh, we're very fortunate to have him here with us today. So Admiral Carter, over to you. Good afternoon, everybody. I can't tell you how excited I am here to be here. This is the first time I've been here to Johns Hopkins in the Applied Physics Lab, and it's great to see my friend Tim here. Now, Tim, uh, you all know him very well. You don't know me very well, but uh, Tim graduated the year behind me, so I, you know he's still a young guy. <laughs> but we were in the same company, so I mean we 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 have history that dates back to when he was a plebe and I was a you know, sophomore, what we call a youngster at the Naval Academy. So I'm still trying to teach him like he's a plea, but you know. It's just... <laughs> didn't work no, it didn't work then. <laughs> but uh, I, I am uh, truly excited to be here with you. Uh, I've been the superintendent now since uh, July 23rd of this uh, past summer. So I'm just about past that point in my life at the Naval Academy where I don't get looked at as the new guy on the block. Now, of course, in big college presidencies and universities, I am still very much a, a freshman. But as I get a chance to go around the country, uh, I want to have an opportunity to talk to uh, the most influential people that I can be around. And, I, and I'm, I'm not kidding. When I look across this audience, some of who I know in here, many of whom I don't, I know there's some Naval Academy graduates in here. This is an influential group of scientists, people that have amazing minds. And I want to be able to tell you a few things that I have learned in my 33 years of being in the Navy and where I see us currently right now at the Naval Academy, where I see us going with developing this last crop of millennial generation young men and women and what I'm already observing in some trends. So I'm going to give you some insight a little bit into me. This is stuff that you can't read in my biography. It'll help uh, you understand a little bit about uh, uh, the path to uh, which I came. Uh, Bob Finlayson, where's, where's Nitro? So we actually have somebody here in the audience uh, who I actually have F4 Phantom time with together. Uh, Bob and I actually flew together in VF-161 off the USS Midway, now a museum out in San Diego. So you know that you're living in really high cotton when you're talking about you know, things that have been retired for you know, well over 30 years. Uh, that was my first operational experience uh, in the Navy. Uh, I graduated in 1981 at the Naval Academy. I was an oceanography and physics major. Uh, I ended up going to Pensacola as a pilot. And uh, back then, if you weren't perfect 2020 vision, you were not allowed to stay as a pilot. And I did not. I failed my first eye test. So my first opportunity to be told I couldn't do something. Uh, and I transitioned to be a Naval flight officer, which basically meant I flew in the back seat of something. And I got into fighters. I uh, went out to the USS Midway, and uh, one of the amazing things was I was only 23 years old, and the very first mission I had on September 1st, 1983, was to go intercept a Soviet bomber, uh, just literally uh, the day that uh, the, uh, the Soviet Union shot down Korean Airline 007. It was a 350-mile intercept. We were completely out of communications range, uh, and I, the guy I was flying with wasn't much older than I was, and we had live weapons on board. I thought we were going to go shoot this guy down. Um, of course, we didn't. Uh, I'd be famous in a different way if we, if, we did, if we had. But that was the type of world that we lived in in the height of the Cold War. And of course, flying on board the Midway, this is an era where airplanes didn't fly themselves. They really required a lot of pilot skills. And I flew with a, a lieutenant uh, who has sadly passed away a few years ago named Rory Banks. And, uh, Rory was one of these guys that just thought differently than anybody else. For some reason, he believed that I could fly the airplane from the back seat without a stick and throttle, 
by telling them what to do. So he would actually put the mirrors from the front seat down so I could watch his hands on the stick and throttle. And with my sense of aviation skills, kind of a seat of the pants sense, uh, he would practice with me to have him tell him, have me tell him what to do with the stick and throttle so that if he closed his eyes, he could actually land the airplane on the aircraft carrier. Imagine this. Now, this is an era where, you know, aircraft carrier was small enough in some of the sea states where we actually sometimes see the propellers of the Midway come out of the water. And I had, uh, you know, well over 100 carrier landings with him. So after I went through Top Gun and did that in a Phantom, I got to go to Miramar and be a flight instructor. And for four years, I taught, then it was only men flying the F-14 Tomcat, how to land the F-14 Tomcat on aircraft carriers. And that was really my mark into the Navy. Uh, the reason I have so many carrier landings, a lot of people ask, how, do you, how did you get so many? Is because by the time I went back to the fleet as a, uh, you know, almost lieutenant commander, I had 1,000 carrier landings, which is kind of the 3,000 hits in baseball landmark number that, you, that most aviators hope to achieve. Uh, I took 32 pilots to aircraft carriers in those four years, and I never had a disqualification because of what Rory Banks allowed me to do that kind of out-of-the-box thinking. But what I really learned is what motivates a human to do something in the most stressful environment humanly possible, which is to land a high-performance aircraft on the pitching deck of an aircraft carrier. That shaped a lot of how I think, how I interacted with people, and, and how I moved along in the business of being in naval aviation for many years. As I got more senior, I was allowed to participate, be involved in, lead some pretty special projects, things that really have shaped uh, how I see the military, and I've been allowed to stay operational all the way up to even two summers ago. I was still flying operationally and tactically in F-18 Super Hornets off the USS Enterprise. I was a strike group commander for her last deployment in the summer of 2012. I, I flew with only lieutenants as the admiral in their back seat, which is also a fascinating human experiment. <laughs> But uh, prior to that, uh, I, I had the opportunity to go to Nuke Power School. So as a post-squadron commander, I'm almost 40 years old, I went to the Navy's toughest academic program, which is Navy Nuclear Power Program, the same one that Tim Galpin went to, uh, but I, I was a lot older. And a year and a half of uh, nuclear engineering and uh, about 52 exams, a lot of stand-up evaluations, uh, I got to see a whole different part of the Navy than I had ever learned in an F-14 or an F-4. Eventually, I went on to command USS Carl Vinson, but not the typical type of aircraft carrier command that you would envision. I got to do the ultimate science fair project. I got to take Carl Vinson through what we call a refueling and complex overhaul, RCOH, arguably the most challenging industrial uh, evolution that mankind has ever evolved. Uh, this is where you take a, an aircraft carrier 1,100 feet long, as long as the Empire State Building is tall, take it out of the water, put it on 297 blocks, and you basically do what would be the same as doing a frame-off restoration of a 57 Chevy, except that you've got, you know, a couple hundred miles of cabling, two nuclear reactors, and you take everything apart and put it back together within the existing framework. So all the things that I thought I had learned about being in the business up to that point was completely challenged. I had a full complement crew of 3,300 and a shipyard uh, contract workforce, which was then north of Grumman uh, in Newport News. Uh, they had a, a shipyard base of about 15,000 employees, uh, of which I had about 1,000 of them come on board my ship every day. $2 billion project. Carl Vinson was 25 years old. 40-month project, we delivered for the first time. She was the third of the Nimitz-class carriers to go through this. We were the first carrier to deliver under budget and reasonably on time. On time is, <laughs> you all get that. 40 months, we delivered her in 44 months. And Carl Vincent has since now, she's on her fifth deployment, uh, been very, very successful. But I learned more about the interaction between shipyard workers at every level, from foreman down to blowtorch man to fire extinguishers to uh, the crew and rebuilding that carry that I would have never gotten if I had just gone and driven those aircraft carriers around a long time. Another interesting project that I got to do with Miss Christine Fox, who I know is not here today, but we had a chance to chat a little bit. Uh, she was the head of uh, CAPE in the year 2010, which is the uh, 
the cost analysis program office that works directly for the Secretary of Defense. Secretary Gates at the time had said, we're going to shut down some big parts of the DOD to include U.S. Joint Forces Command. Now, some of you may remember that. Maybe some of you even had worked there or had interaction with them. This was a command that had been started in 1999 to promote jointness amongst all of the other combatant commands, which at the time, were, there were 10, six geographic and four functional. So U.S. Joint Forces Command being the one command that was out there to do everything from training to experimentation to uh, how we do acquisition uh, within the joint world. Well, in 1999, the total complement of the workforce there had been a couple hundred. After 9-11, it grew, and like a lot of things in DOD, it grew not just once, not just twice, but fourfold to the point where we had over 6,000 employees, half of whom were contractor. And when we looked at it, you know, it just became something that was so big, it was crushing under its own weight. Secretary of Defense Gates said, we're going to close Joint Forces Command. And I was a brand new one star, and I got handed the task of, from General Odierno, who was still in Iraq as the, uh, the head of U.S. Joint Forces Command. He said, Carter, congratulations. You are the planner and executioner for how we're going to shut down U.S. Joint Forces Command. Go. It, it was much harder than Nuke Power School uh, to deal with the, the people, the contractors, to take a command that was on 25 different sites across the country. There was infrastructure. I mean, it was a billion dollar a year enterprise. That's how much it cost to run U.S. Joint Forces Command in 2010. We did shut it down on August 4th, 2011. We did a, a very, very good analysis of what needed to be saved, how to not hurt the people, uh, how to deal with the contracts. And of all the things, if you go back and look at what Secretary Gates said would close back in 2010, it was the only one. And we retained about 50% of the people at about 50% of the budget and retained 75% of the functionality. So that was quite a project to, to go through with the secretary and all of those folks. I learned a lot in that. Uh, when I came home off of Enterprise, which was its own learning curve, by the way, and I, I can talk more about that afterwards, about what it was like to take a 51-year-old aircraft carrier on an eight-month combat deployment and go through the Strait of Hormuz with her 10 times. Think about the country of Iran, who in 1988 had their entire navy sunk by the same ship. You want to talk about respect. Um, it was an interesting time, to, and that was the era where Iran was threatening about closing the, the strait with mines again. But when I came home from that, uh, there was a really big struggle within DOD, uh, and it was across all the services, and it was dealing with suicide. Uh, the Army had seen a huge spike, but all the services had seen that. So the CNO, the Chief of Naval Operations, and the Secretary of the Navy asked me, along with a team of whoever I wanted to pick, to go in a room, spend as much time as I needed, pick whoever I wanted, and come back and tell the Navy how we could reduce suicide in our ranks. Now, I've slept at a few Holiday Inn Expresses in my life, but this was a, one of those moments where I said, w how am I going to come solve a, you know, since the beginning of human civilization, a problem that has never been fixed. And I've got a month or four months or six months, whatever. Well, I took a bunch of operators. I took some medical people. I had access to the biggest and brightest minds across the country, including all the other services. And uh, I won't give you the full details. Of the report's actually available online. It's called Task Force Resilient. And we made recommendations. Uh, about 30 very discreet recommendations. Had a lot to do with training and education, understanding, stigma, and a lot of, I would call them myth busters about who and why and how this thing happens. And uh, the Navy embraced it. And uh, even though all of the services have seen a reduction in suicide and suicide-related behavior, the Navy, because they did keep an open mind to this, and they accepted uh, all the recommendations that we gave them, which were done at a fairly cost-neutral level. In other words, don't spend a whole bunch of money to get after these things. Stop doing a bunch of things so that you can use that trade space. The Navy reduced suicide from 2012 to 2013 by about 25 percent, not insignificant, and we're sustaining that right now. Now, you have to be careful about hanging your hat on that because it is a very uh, intricate and hard to understand uh, problem, and it's one that is not affecting the youth of our country as much as it's affecting a lot of the folks that are our age that are sitting in here. Um, 
And then I got the chance to go up to the War College. Now, I was only the president of the War College for one year, but uh, that opportunity was a chance to think about where the Navy is today, how it stays connected to the fleet, and how are we producing the critical thinkers at that mid-grade and senior level for not just the Navy, but for the entire Department of Defense. And some of my comments and maybe some of the, the areas in which we can go can be centered around some of that. I'm gonna to plan to talk for maybe about 30 more minutes from here, and I'm gonna to talk to you a little bit about what I see our, our Navy doing, what I think are some trends that I have observed, not just while I was at the War College over my 33 years of being in uniform and having been on many, many deployments to different corners of the world. And then I'm gonna to try to tell you what I see happening in the Naval Academy and how I'm taking what I think is a very fine and good uh, position institution and, and we're, how we're gonna make it better. So three things that I'd like to point out that uh, won't shock anybody in this room, but three things that I think are very important for us to kind of take what Chester Nimitz during World War II would call a running fix of our, of our situation. Uh, the first one is, uh, is terror. Uh, you know, we thought maybe after 9-11, after 13 years of complex ground warfare in Iraq and Afghanistan, and as we're trying to close out those missions that, you know, maybe we've got that kind of taken care of. I mean, uh, I don't think there's anybody in this room, and certainly not those of us that are in uniform, uh, that should be kidding ourselves that this concept of terror, this idea of an asymmetric way to go after such a powerful nation and freedom-loving nations like ourselves and our partners in NATO is not gonna have an impact. I mean, nobody turned on a TV today without seeing the most recent example of what's happening in Paris, France. And, and that's just one that is really out there. I mean, we may not have paid as much attention to some of the things that happen at a you know, children's schoolhouse in Pakistan or what happened at a cafe in Australia. Uh, and because they're not happening right here in our backyard, we shouldn't be so naive to think this is still a real and viable threat that we have to constantly be prepared for and think through. Uh, the second one is uh, technology. And this is certainly in your wheelhouse here. I mean, I got a chance to walk around and see some of the amazing things that you're doing, not just in uh, robotics and uh, you know, things that you make here, but certainly in the cyber domain, uh, technology is moving at a meteoric pace. We are going through another level of change that will redefine the revolution of mankind, and it's happening so fast in front of us, I think sometimes we just can't actually see what it is. You know, I think back to the days when Nitro and I were flying around on an F-4. If we'd had a complete cyber attack to the point where we had no electronics emitting from an aircraft carrier or from all those things, but we knew what our mission is, we could still fly in that airplane and do something from that airplane. We're kind of past that point now. You know, if a network shut down, satellites don't work, we are pretty much brought to our knees. And they're not just talking from a military perspective, we're talking about financial to the, even operating your, you know, your darn refrigerator. <laughs> so we, we're, we're going into new territory and we're, and we're going there very, very fast. And once in a while we get a reminder that we are so vulnerable when we watch what happened you know, to, to Sony, regardless of who you believe actually did it, uh, it happened and we are vulnerable in that way. So we, we have some challenges there that we have to be aware of, and it's changing even the way we think in the military. So let me give you this perspective, just a quick snapshot of just the United States Navy, and I'll try to do this very quickly. So when I came back to Miramar to be a, you know, a Top Gun F-14 flight instructor back in 1986, Secretary John Lehman was the Secretary of the Navy, Ronald Reagan was the President, and we had 600 ships. We didn't have 600 ships very long, but we built up to 600 ships. The United States Navy was one million strong, active in reserve. Now, we were pretty capable. We had 15 aircraft carriers. That was the centerpiece of our Navy and a lot of ships. And we were deployed uh, at about roughly about 20 to 25 percent of that force was out there in all of the regions of the world. Now, today, we have 291 ships. 10 aircraft carriers, arguably 11 if you count Enterprise getting tore up while we're building the Gerald R. Ford, and 325,000 active duty sailors, about another 107,000 reservists, 200,000 civilians that took on a lot of those things that we took away from those sailors when we retired them and went to a smaller force. At this very moment, there's 105 ships deployed somewhere around the globe, mostly in the Pacific 
and still some in the central region. And what are they doing? Uh, well, they're doing some of the same things that we did in 1986, but we're expected to do them better and faster and be more responsive than ever before because of that first thing we talked about with technology, life's changing. And I'll talk more about the missions of the United States Navy when I talk about my next point in trend, and that is the globe is changing. Climate, geography, it is changing. And it's changing at a rate that we probably would like to say is just the natural process, but because of the population and where we are populated and what we do in terms of agriculture and what we're doing in terms of cultivating our lands, we as humans are changing our landscape maybe faster than we'd like to. And I'm not just talking about whether or not you believe in climate change, uh, global warming. You know, we can argue whether or not the Arctic ice cap is truly melting or whether we're just going through a phase. Uh, I personally believe that it is actually melting and that we will have a new northern passage that will allow deep draft ships and ships that are, you know, in the 180,000 ton displacement to cross over the top of the globe. So as we argue that the Earth is 70% covered by water, it is changing, and there's more water. And it's changing the tidal movements. Uh, just right here where we live here off the Chesapeake, there's this thing called the, the king tide. It's changing. And we see it every couple weeks in Annapolis. We have to pay attention to that. About 80% of the population lives within about 50 miles of the coastline. That's globally. So if our environment's changing there, what does that do to the population? Look at, look at what's happening out in uh, the Seattle area, in the Pac Northwest. They're, they're experiencing mudslides, houses falling into the ocean, coastlines moving. And then think about how we move goods and services around the world. And this is maybe the most important part because as we're still a fossil fuel globe, uh, easily 63% of everything in terms of liquid and natural gas moved by large ships over the water. And as you think about how things move across the globe, just like anything, trying to get into a stadium for a sports game, and by the way, I love the Patriots jersey. Um, <laughs> things have to go through things called choke points. And there are arguably six major choke points in the world, from the Strait of Gibraltar, to the Suez Canal, to the Babylon Middle Strait, to the Strait of Hormuz, the Strait of Malacca. And you know, we could argue about the Bering Strait. If your friendly forces are not there to make sure those, those straits are open, we could just talk about two, the Strait of Hormuz and the Strait of Malacca. 90% of anything that produces a fossil fuel goes through those two straits to support all of the Asian nations. If those things close, the hyper-connected globe and its economic situation will be brought to its knees. So who makes sure all those things stay open? Well, with only 300 roughly ships in the Navy today, we can't be in all of them all of the time. And we do have Coast Guards and we do have coalition partners. There's roughly something about 850 ships of coalition nations with whom we're friendly. And even though we're half the size of the number of ships that we used to be, we're still 13 times larger by just gross tonnage than any other Navy combined. But what can we do with those ships? And what, where do we want to be? And where do we have the biggest impact to make sure that we have a deterrent value, that we have an assurance value, and that when asked to bring some sort of effect, whether it be kinetic or non-kinetic, we're ready to do that. So those are just some of the things in terms of trends and what our United States Navy is doing. And of course, the Navy is a complex organization today, even with only 325,000 sailors and officers we're 18 different communities, from doctors, lawyers, dentists, public affairs officers, civil engineers. You kind of get the idea. There's really only five, soon to be six, warfighting communities in the Navy. Aviators, submariners, ship drivers, Navy SEALs, explosive ordnance disposal, and then this new designation that we consider to be called Independent uh, uh, information Dominance Corps, which includes everything from intelligence to oceanographers to cyber warriors. And we're moving on this discussion about what is a true unrestricted line officer in the Navy today. For the first time this year, we put 
midshipmen graduating this class into that community who were physically qualified to go serve in any of those other five communities. And I'll talk more about that down the road. So we in the Navy are paying attention to all that. And as the Army is having to look at how they're going to reduce their number of soldiers in uniform after they come out of Afghanistan, the Navy is not talking about reducing numbers of bodies. I'd like to tell you we're going to get to 350 or 400 ships. That's not likely to happen. We will get back over 300. But the Navy and the Marine Corps team, I believe, because of the understanding of those trends and the fact that I don't need permission to put some of those ships where they need to be to make a difference, I would believe, and not just because I'm wearing a Navy uniform, is going to be the service of consequence in the future. And I'm talking about the next 10 to 25 years. So as we think and partner between what I'm doing as that first educational institution at the Naval Academy, what you do here, there are definitely synergies that we should be partnering on and things that we can be working on. So as I got to the Naval Academy, I wanted to make sure I understood what, what I had there. You know, I graduated in 1981. I hadn't really been there uh, for most of my career except to visit and go to an occasional football game. And I will tell you right up front, I was very impressed with what I saw. I, I, I immediately did my own analysis to figure out who are the influencers for the product, which is the Brigade of Midshipmen. Now, we have a very specific mission statement. Some of you have probably heard some portion of it, might even recognize some of it. The front end of it says to uh, develop midshipmen morally, mentally, and physically to imbue them with the highest standards of duty, honor, and loyalty for a career in the sea services. Pretty straightforward. Those three key words, morally, mentally, physically, a lot of times we think that way there. And I will tell you right up front, from the day I got there to even where we are right now, we are doing a very fine job at preparing midshipmen in those three categories to become ensigns and second lieutenants, uh, ensigns in the Navy, second lieutenants in the Marine Corps. But it's the backside of the mission statement that separates us, I believe, from any other military academy. And it's one that I am taking on very seriously, and I want to share that with you. And that's to look for those midshipmen with the potential for development and mind and character to assume the highest level of responsibilities in command, citizenship, and government. So let's think about those three words. Command, and we're talking about future leaders of the Navy and the Marine Corps. Citizenship, CEOs of corporate America, those who run the country from an economic and business perspective, and government. We're talking about future senators, congressmen, and, and beyond, policymakers. We believe at the Naval Academy we're there to produce future leaders, men and women, of character and consequence that will fill in those categories. So everything I else I tell you after this is all underpinned by those two facts in our mission statement. Uh, we have 4,500 midshipmen at the Naval Academy. That's the product. Uh, by Title 10, I am capped at having 4,400 midshipmen the day prior to every graduation. Those are, the, those are the numbers. I produce about 800 Navy ensigns a year and about 250 to 270 Marine Corps officers a year. For perspective, that's about 30% of all the new ensigns that are produced in the Navy. The other two accession sources are Reserve Officer Training Command, about 77 different campuses across the country. And then Officer Training Command, which some of you may remember as Officer Candidate School. You might remember that being called the 90-Day Wonders. Uh, it's actually less than that now. They're even more wondrous. They, they get produced in about 12 weeks. Um, so the Naval Academy uh, for just officers in the Navy are only producing about 30% of the new officers every year. Uh, in the Marine Corps side, we only produce about 20% of the Marine Corps officer per year at about 250 to 270. So as you say, well, how do they compare to the rest? Uh, I'll just give you this interesting statistic. And this is not the only way to measure success. There are many other ways. But uh, for those that stay in the Navy, and I'm talking up to that 20-year career point, which, by the way, I don't uh, prescribe to the idea that uh, a successful career is just somebody who stays in 20. But for those that are at the running the administrative part of the Navy, the, the Navy captains or the 06s and the flag level, the percentage of those that are Naval Academy graduates uh, start to go above the other accession sources and rises exponentially beyond that. So at the captain level for 2014 in the unrestricted line communities, 
about 40% of the officers are Naval Academy grads. When you get to the one-star level, it goes up to a little bit more than that. And at the two-star select level, that's not even the ones that are wearing it yet, it gets to 60%, three-star level, 75%. And for the four stars, of which are about 10 active duty, uh, we are usually between 80 and 90% of them are Naval Academy graduates. Uh, so I tell you that because these are the future folks that run the Naval Academy. Over the history of the Naval Academy, we're 169 years old uh, thus far. Um, we've produced 23 senators and congressmen, uh, a president. Uh, we've had 73 Medal of Honor winners. Uh, and we are the only institution other than Michigan who can say they've had a president, a Heisman Trophy winner, and a Naismith Trophy winner. Uh, Naismith is the basketball version of the Heisman. David Robinson, Roger Staubach, Joe Bellino, and of course, uh, President Jimmy Carter. Michigan can claim that same stat. So, you know, when I get to talk to other, you know, universities, I kind of bring that up, and that doesn't always go over so well. <laughs> but the Naval Academy right now, uh, as you look at our campus, and I know a lot of you have either been there, either went to school there, or have seen it, it's a tiny campus. The whole thing's only 338 acres. Uh, I have 600 professors that teach there, half civilian, half military. About half of the civilian professors are tenured, and virtually all of them are PhD. Uh, we teach 25 majors. They're voluntary, so I don't force midshipmen to pick a major. They pick it at the end of their freshman year. Uh, I'm very unique across my service academy counterparts in that 65% of my majors and those who participate in those majors are in the science, technology, engineering, and math fields. So if you want to know what the others are doing, if you, do I have a West Point graduate in here? Do I have any West Point graduates? All right. Love to have West Point graduates around me. West Point, who has a phenomenal uh, curriculum as well, uh, they're about 35% on the technical side. So they spend uh, much more investment in their student body and in the humanities than what we are currently doing at the Naval Academy. And the Air Force Academy is about 50%, which you know, a lot of people think the Air Force Academy and the Air Force is such a technical uh, force, uh, the Naval Academy focuses much more on the technical side. So this year, 2015, 70% of the little over 1,150 graduates uh, are graduating with a major that's in a uh, technical either tier one, which is pure engineering, tier two, science, math, or chemistry, uh, compared to about 30%, which are humanities, English, history, political science, or language. Uh, we can talk about whether or not that's the right mix and what that gets for us. Um, on the physical side of our mission, uh, the Naval Academy enjoys uh, arguably one of the best sports programs that's going on in the country. Um, when I went to uh, our first game this year, a lot of you may remember, we opened up by playing Ohio State in Baltimore uh, at M&T Raven Stadium. So my first job was to go to uh, the Hilton and talk to a whole bunch of supporters at the ballroom there at the Hilton prior to the game. So I get there, you know, this thing's huge. It holds like a 1,000 people. And as I open the door, I am greeted by a sea of red. There's at least 900 Ohio State fans there, and maybe 100 Navy fans. And, you know, uh, Archie Griffin, uh, their two-time Heisman Trophy winner, you know, they've won nine football championships. I mean, they are, you know, in the athletics world, they are the king of the hill. And of course, they hand me a microphone like this and say, hey, address the crowd. So this is what I told them. Uh, I said, hey, congratulations to, to Ohio State. You are the number one participant in Division I sports programs in the country. You have 20 women's programs, 19 men's varsity Division I programs. That's the largest in the country. You know, by the way, your undergraduate student body population is 53,500. Now today, you're gonna to meet a Naval Academy football team that is one of 33 Division I sports programs at the Naval Academy. We are number three in the country, only behind you and Stanford. And oh yeah, my student body is 4,500. Good luck. <laughs> now they did beat us, but we gave them a heck of a game. And here they are, they're playing in the national championship. And we, we were beating them for a while. Um, and by the way, I went on the field for the coin toss. Unbelievable. They outweighed us 50 pounds a man. I'm not making this up. They were huge. Um, 
But what's really remarkable, to put this all in context, with a student body of about 4,500, one in three of all of my midshipmen compete at the Division I sports level. And even put more of it in context, for the women that I have at the Naval Academy, which is about 980 women at the Naval Academy out of 4,500, 42% of them are competing at the Division I level. Now, some of you will say, well, why, why would you care? Why, why are you spending that kind of money to run 33 Division I sports programs. So I'll give you two points right up front. The first is to fight and win and in combat and sustain peace, we as a nation should seek the scholar athlete. That's who does well in that scenario. Uh, the second point I will make is uh, through some very good work done through my athletic department and people well before me, the American public uh, enjoys an amazing enterprise of sports programs at the Naval Academy that costs you and me as taxpayers virtually nothing. It's a $45 million enterprise to run 33 Division I sports programs. I receive less than $3 million in acquisition money uh, for my budget to run those. So it sustains itself, and that's a wonderful thing. So for my West Point friends, I share that with my folks up there and at the Air Force Academy because I honestly don't think it's a mistake that we've beaten Army 13 years in a row. <laughs> now, I have to give it to Air Force. They, they did beat us this year. They, they got the Commander-in-Chief trophy, but they're coming to our backyard next year, so we'll see how that goes. Uh, Ken Niamatololo, our, our uh, seven-year uh, football coach at Navy, uh, was just named by the, uh, the East Coast uh, Athletic Conference as the Coach of the Year this year. He's uh, the winningest coach in the history of Navy, and he's done it all in only seven years. And I will tell you that as I transition to my next piece here about what is it that gets midshipmen to understand the moral concept, the moral fabric of what we want them to do, I spend a lot of time with the coach, and I'm in the locker room with that football team. And yes, he does talk about winning and losing, but he talks them about how to behave. And it's really refreshing to see a coach who is at this exceptional level, and trust me, a coach like Ken Niamatololo could go anywhere, and he chooses to stay at Navy, and he's really doing a great job. And I see that out of a lot of our coaches. But how do you teach ethics and moral behavior to a crop of young kids that are coming from every corner of the country, representative of all 50 states? This is probably our biggest task. You know, and the, the challenges of today in terms of uh, destructive behaviors, uh, behaviors that grab headlines in terms of sexual assault on college campuses. This is the charge of the day, and how do we go after that? And I will tell you that we have spent a lot of time on that, and I'm watching how we're going forward on that. Uh, my last year up in Newport, I helped the Navy by penning a piece called Ethics in the Navy. And I charged the Navy from my seat up there as the head of education for the Navy to say, we're thinking about ethics all wrong. We think of it as a legalistic, what's right and wrong, and we haven't yet to get into how we get into the personal decision space of every single sailor, every single officer, every single chief petty officer, man and woman, from boot camp to Naval Academy to ROTC to Officer Training Command, all the way to flag. And until we understand how we change the biases of which many of our young people carry, uh, we'll never really make an effective change. And what we've already learned at the Naval Academy is trying to have an old guy like me wag their finger at a bunch of young people not very effective. And most of us as parents know that doesn't work very well either. But when you get the young kids want to teach it to themselves and take it on themselves at a peer-based level, now you start to make traction. And that's what we're finding is, is having success for us right now. And we're working on that. And I'm very proud of the fact that when President Obama rolled out the It's On Us campaign a few months ago, they didn't ask for any other college presidents to be there, but they did ask for the three service academy superintendents to be there. Because as much as we've had our share of headlines for mistakes that have been made in the past, I'm not telling you we've already turned the corner, we have it solved. I'm telling you we are being more transparent and more open about how to get after these challenges and the, what some people call the continuum of harm that the other college presidents and universities are just now starting to grapple with. And this is, uh, this is important for us because it's important for the future of our children, our grandchildren, and for what's right. 
the simple idea here that I'm trying to express to our young people is how you act in peacetime is no different than how you act in wartime. And I have the experience to talk to that. Um, because there's this idea that you, you do things differently. You have a different set of rules by which you live by when you're in an active combat zone, and that's not true. So we're very involved in making sure that we get that aspect of it uh, done right as well. Now, I just want to finish up here by telling you what type of uh, young man or woman is applying to come to the Naval Academy. This is uh, maybe the most encouraging story that I will tell you. Because despite what you might read in some blogs or some things that are out in the open press, even recently, uh, one of the most competitive programs in the United States right now are those that want to come to the United States Naval Academy. And this could be because it's the end of the millennial generation, a generation of young people that believe in serving for something that's bigger than themselves. Uh, I would like to think it's the reputation, the Naval Academy, and the mission of the United States Navy and the Marine Corps. Um, but I actually do believe it's because they see the value of the institution. So for the class of 2018 that's there right now, um, it's one of the most diverse groups we've ever had. Uh, we define our diversity at the Naval Academy through self-identification, meaning that somebody tells us to which diversity group they feel they belong. We validate that, but we do not go out. And this is the challenge of today. You know, America has become such a melting pot. I'm not sure how we even define diversity anymore. Uh, but we look at that part. Uh, the number of women coming to the Naval Academy is, is rising. I have 200 more women at the Naval Academy than West Point does. I have 100 more women at the Naval Academy than the Air Force Academy does. I'm about 22.5% across all four classes. The class of 2018, 25.5%. That's roughly 300 plus women in a class of 1,191. They were so good when they came in. They had the highest SAT scores in the history of the Naval Academy on average. It was a little over 1340 average. That, remember, it includes all the athletes, everybody from the number one valedictorians out of high school class to everybody else. They validated more classes through what they took AP in high school and prep school than we'd ever seen in a 169-year history, about 2,600 courses in math, science to include chemistry, and English. Again, what that means is after taking 19 to 21 credit hours per semester, they will have finished the whole Naval Academy curriculum by, by the time they get to their last semester senior year. We've never seen that before. So we are now rethinking what graduate level opportunities we should be giving these seniors at least on the back half of their senior year. They're more physically qualified than any group we've ever seen before. 90% had a varsity letter in their record and 67% of them were team captains. Here's the other thing that's interesting. You know, we don't recruit for any music programs in the Naval Academy, but one in four midshipmen participate in some high-end music thing at the Naval Academy, whether it be theatrical, the glee clubs, which get a lot of national prominence, our drum and bugle corps, the oldest in the country at 100 years old. Uh, that's just part of the whole person that comes to the Naval Academy. Uh, a lot of people think that you have to be the son or daughter of an admiral or a captain or somebody that graduated from the Naval Academy to get in there. Uh, the truth is, in the class of 2018, only 70 midshipmen had a mom or dad who had graduated from the Naval Academy. And actually, we took in more former enlisted at the Naval Academy than we took in what we would call a legacy. So it's a different crop of young men and women than had gone there when I was there. Now, when I graduated in 1981 in my class, the attrition, in other words, those who left from plebe induction day to graduation was over 33%. One in three that started left. Today, we are starting to approach single-digit attrition, percentage-wise. So this past summer, 2018, 1,191 started. Nine midshipmen voluntarily resigned. That's a record. So that's a good news story, but also a, a challenging story, because uh, for those that went to the Naval Academy, saying, well, you're not, you're not hard enough on them. You should be working them harder, right? Uh, they're just that much better. They're showing it in their grade point average. Average grade point average when I was there was about a 2.68. Today it's about a 3.2. And I got a lot of the same instructors still. <laughs> they're just that much smarter. And the partnering that we're trying to do, the, the changes that are out in front of us in terms of what we're doing majors, we've recently created a cyber major. It's one of the first at this undergraduate level created in the country. We don't have it all figured out yet. We're, we're still working toward it. But 
Our ability to partner and do internships here at Johns Hopkins will be critical to our success. Uh, I just got $120 million in the fiscal year 15 appropriated budget to build a cyber center. So as small as my campus is, I'm going to build a 206,000 square foot cyber operations academic building that'll have laboratory and most importantly, it'll have a skiff that'll be about the size of this auditorium right here where I can talk at the classified level. I currently don't have a space like that on the Naval Academy grounds. Um, I have a, a rotary wing discipline in our aerospace major. I have a newly uh, developed a nuclear engineering major and a new operations research major. That makes up a, a total of 25 different majors. So uh, we're at about the right balance for where we want to be. But as I said earlier, very focused on the technical. And when Tim and I were there, it was about a 60-40 technical humanity split. Today, we are self-prescribed 65-35. I'm, I'm looking at where that right balance is. So um, we're very technically focused uh, right now. But at the end of the day, I will tell you that you should be very proud of what the Naval Academy is producing. Uh, this year's service selection uh, was um, transformational. We don't just pick who goes into what designation based on their class rank. That's how it was, again, when Tim and I were there. If you graduate number in the class, you get your first choice. Today, we put them through different aptitude challenges. So I do produce Navy SEALs out of the Naval Academy. It's the only designation right now that women cannot voluntarily sign up for. That, that day is coming, I believe. But what's unique about the Naval Academy is the most challenging program to get a designation. I'm 80% successful for those midshipmen that go to basic underwater demolition school out in San Diego that eventually get to put that sealed trident on their chest. No other, no other program is even in the ballpark. The average attrition rate for a Navy SEAL right now is about 75%. And of course, that, that also goes across the other designators. Uh, but at the end of the day, and again, we put our, our midshipmen into the service selections that they rack and stack from their number one choice to number five, we were 96.3% in putting them in either their first or second choice. That was the highest in the history of the Naval Academy, which tells me that they're better educated and the aptitude tests that we put them through tells them what they are suited to go do, whether it be fly a jet, drive a submarine and get the nuclear power school or become a Navy SEAL. And for the first time, we created cyber warriors from the same crop of midshipmen who were physically qualified to go do anything else. And that will only grow. So that's just a little bit about what's happening at the Naval Academy today. Uh, where I see us going, I'm going to focus on three things. I'm gonna to continue to work on the character development piece because I think that's the foundational building blocks of building on trust in ethical decision making. I'm gonna concentrate on continuing to build through cyber education. Currently we have two mandatory courses, one that we teach at the freshman level, one that we teach at the junior level. Uh, those are evolving and again, this is something that I see a wonderful partnership between a couple of key institutions right here in the state of Maryland continuing to grow. And the third is international engagements. Uh, and this is something I've learned over my 33 years is as powerful and as important as our Navy is, we can't be everywhere and we can't do everything on our own. We've got to have the, the key partnerships across the globe, especially through the Navy. And today I send about 350 midshipmen uh, abroad internationally to either do a semester study abroad, about 60 a semester. Uh, I send a number of midshipmen on training uh, vessels across the country, or across the globe, and some other experiential leadership opportunities, mostly in language. Uh, but I'd like us to do more. I'd like us to get to about 500 exchanges a year that gives on average about 50% of midshipmen across their four years a chance for a significant international experience. That'll grow them, that'll mature them, and it sets the very beginnings of creating coalition partners. So those are the three things that I'm gonna continue our already positive upward trajectory as we move forward with the Naval Academy. So I want to say thank you for listening to me. I'm going to uh, wrap up here and uh, take some of your questions. But as we go through the questions, I ask that, uh, you know, through the course of your weekend, as you're watching and enjoying the New England Patriots beating up on the Baltimore Ravens, <laughs> I just had to get that in there, that uh, we don't forget the reason we get to enjoy those freedoms. It's because we do have over 100 ships, and we do have a whole bunch of Marines that are deployed all around the globe doing things that 
we sometimes don't even think about or have to think about or imagine, like landing a high-performance tactical jet aircraft on a pitching deck of an aircraft carrier, just so we can enjoy the very freedoms that we have here. So I ask that you just think about that sometime over your weekend. So thank you again, and uh, I'm happy to take some questions. I know it's not a shy crowd, so uh, we can go anywhere you want. Yes, ma'am. What specific changes did you make in the Navy that dealt with suicide prevention? So the question is, uh, what, what specific uh, changes did I recommend uh, in the Navy to change the, the course a little bit on suicide. Well, the first thing I will tell you is uh, uh, I, I took uh, the entire flag community and I was allowed to brief them in one room after I did this study. And I, and I sat them all down. I said, I, I'm not using any slides. I'm gonna tell you a whole bunch of things that you thought were true about suicide that are absolutely not. Uh, the first thing I said is uh, it is preventable. Now, not all preventable, but there is some portion that is. The second is, is this is not a millennial generation problem. Uh, there was a, a period of time when we were assessing uh, young sailors and soldiers and Marines that were allowed to have a minor felony in their record when we were going through a surge in our ground wars. And there was this idea that because we had assessed this certain percentage that were well below what we might normally take, that that was the reason we had this spike in suicide. It turned out it's the exact opposite. None of those people were part of that population. Um, the third is, is that transition is the most vulnerable time. Uh, there are many others, and I, I won't go into the long lecture, but transitions and the understanding that about 10% of the population actively think about this. As an, as an option, which is a scary thing. And then the, the idea of how to properly reduce the stigma, how to actually listen to somebody, and this idea that you know, if you just get yourself in good physical shape, that this isn't no longer a problem for you. Uh, and then the training that we were doing, kind of a one size fits all, that we're talking to everybody like they were either suicidal or that you, by me teaching you, you would know exactly what to look for so that you could prevent it. Uh, we didn't have the training right. Um, and in fact, uh, I believe that we were nibbling on the edges of a thing called contagion effect. We were talking about it so much that we actually made it a viable thing to think about. Um, so we changed some of the way that we were doing the training. Uh, we changed the understanding of what's different between training, which is a repetitive process of doing something so that you will actually repeat it, versus education, which is about growth and understanding. And we actually changed this idea that, you know, maybe we need more people that are not in uniform that can be approachable so that somebody can go in and say, I kind of need to take a knee for a little bit. I'm having some real challenges. And do it with this idea that you don't lose your security clearance, that you're no longer not allowed to operate some heavy piece of equipment, so that all those options are still available for when you come back. So uh, there was some cost to this idea that we would produce these things I call them resiliency counselors. And we even looked at ideas, for example, at the Naval Academy, you know, everybody has something that you, you might think of as a place where you would go to get some medical help. So instead of it calling it the suicide hotline or call a friend, at the Naval Academy, we called the Midshipman Development Center. Everybody knows what it is, but it's a place where you can go in, and even, you know, these young people who I don't see as the most troubled population, they need help from the stress and we have created an environment where they can go in with absolutely no stigma of being in that midshipman development center. We're having great success with that at the Naval Academy. Uh, we're putting these resiliency counselors on board all of our large deck ships first, uh, and they're incredibly popular, mostly because they're young and they're not in uniform and they've got the skill sets to be able to talk somebody through these challenges. Um, there are some other uh, pieces to it. It's, there isn't a single, one solution set, it's, it's multifaceted, uh, but the two biggest one is to understand uh, the stigma associated with it and understand that when somebody asks for help, you just can't say, well, get over it. You have to actually offer it to them. Um, the transition piece is a really interesting part of this. Uh, I don't want to get into too much detail, but uh, there were two communities that really showed uh, a high propensity 
to take their life uh, in 2012 in the Navy. The medical community and the nuclear community. Uh, the medical community uh, represented one third of all suicides in the Navy in 2012. There were 60 total in the, uh, in the Navy. The medical community represents about one eighth of the community, of the Navy. It's the largest designator between corpsmen because corpsmen in the Navy serve the Marine Corps and the Navy. So I had to do another deep dive just into that part to understand it. Was this care fatigue? Were there other things involved? And it turned out that that community goes through more transitions than others. And because that is a vulnerable period, a lot of these people were being left to their own devices and they were going through isolation. And depending on where they were, it wasn't always care fatigue. It was just uh, a combination of the, the three aspects that must be present for a suicide to occur. Uh, sense of loneliness, loss of self-worth, and uh, the ability to willingly harm yourself. And in the military, that's something we teach our young men and women that they have to be able to understand pain. And that medical community is one that is a little bit different than some of the others. So we identified those potential root causes and went after it from that. And the medical community had the biggest turnaround in one year. Um, now, of course, I went to the flag community first because if it didn't come from the top down, we weren't going to make that impact. Um, and we created a new office called the 21st Century Sailor Office. And this was a whole new way of thinking about what real fitness is. We have this idea that if you're physically fit, you can do anything. And I try to introduce this concept that real fitness is mental, emotional, social, physical, and spiritual. And and I'm not talking about a denomination of spirits. This is a, uh, a subset that we're very uncomfortable talking about. But somebody that understands themselves in those categories is going to lead and live a much more fruitful life. Probably more than you wanted to hear on that. But that was... How about somebody else? Yes, sir. Admiral, you have um, the achievement coming to the academy from a number of sources, some straight out of high school, some from other colleges, some from prep schools, out of fleet. Do you see any correlation between that and their career at the Naval Academy and their career afterwards, depending on what you decide? Yes, yeah, so this is a great question. This is, uh, talks about uh, the accession sources by which we bring in midshipmen to the Naval Academy, and there are many, and I'll try to break that down a little bit. And then how do they do? And that can be defined in two different answers, and I'll try to break that down in terms of who gets to graduation which is not my focus point, by the way. I, I, that all, if I do everything right, we're gonna be fine there. But to your point, how do they do afterwards? So the Naval Academy takes, uh, we have a Naval Academy prep school up in Newport, Rhode Island. It used to be about 300 strong, primarily uh, former enlisted, uh, some of uh, you know, the kids that we really think will do well in terms of uh, representing the country from an athletic perspective or diversity perspective. A lot of times they're the ones that are a little bit struggle on the SAT scores that we know one extra year of hard math and science will get them in that prep level. Uh, I'm only taking about 200 to 230. So about one fifth of the class comes through that accession source. And the reason that still exists is because without that, I will always struggle to get the prior enlisted uh, in, even if they are coming from Nuke Power School. Uh, I have a prep school program as well. There are, uh, I want to say, 10 um, prep schools scattered around the country that I bring midshipmen in from. And again, that's only about 45 to 50 a year from that accession source. The rest come from high school or prep school or first year college. There's an age limit that requires that they have to be less than 21 years old when they start their plebe year. Uh, and they have to come through various nomination sources. So they come in as a, as a congressional nomination. Every congressional leader, senator, and congressman have a certain number of midshipmen that they are allowed to have on the books at the Naval Academy at any one time. So to give you some of the challenge I have, when Congress has a significant turnover, guess what happens? The outgoings try to shove all their nominations in, and the new folks come in and say they want all of theirs all at the same time. Uh, we make sure that they have close to their full number all the time. That takes up just in a class of, let's just call it 1,000, that takes up close to 650 of the people that come in with a class by itself. So I have to work very closely with members of Congress. I'm, when I say they got skin in the game, it's real. 
so that they're number one, two, three, and all the way down, uh, prioritized nominations are looked at carefully and that they're sending me somebody that can make it through the program. Today, as I mentioned, our success rate getting to graduation is starting to approach 90%. In total number, from I day to graduation right now, I'm at about today, about 86.3%. That puts me at number 12 across every college of any kind in the country. And oh, by the way, they define their graduation rate as some that graduates within six years. I only deal in four years, okay? When you look at the Naval Academy for those that, as I said before, that graduate, no kidding, in four years, or involved in a school that has more than 50% STEM-based majors, I've been number one for four years running. For varsity athletes that play at the Division I level, I am over 90% graduation rate. I am number 10 in the country. And again, these are kids that have raised their right hand and say, I, you know, I support and defend the Constitution of the United States against all enemies. That's pretty remarkable. And you know what the biggest population that has the highest graduation rate? The kid, that 45 to 50 that come from those prep schools. And many of them are varsity athletes. Uh, we are 95% graduation rate on that very small click. The worst population is still the Naval Academy Prep School. Out of that 200 that we take some risk on to make sure that we are the right balance of really representing the nation across all 50 states, across every different pocket of America and all of our territories, I'm about 80 to 82% graduation rate from that crowd. Now, who does best? Going into the fleet, the crowd that had the hardest time graduating. Ironically, the ones that don't stay in the longest, now that we can go into a whole different definition about what is success. I mean, if we're gonna say success is somebody that got to a 20 year career point to retire, then you start to look at some folks that did very well, Rhodes Scholars, you know, Morneau Scholars, Trident Scholars, the best and brightest in the class. A lot of times they don't stay in because they have so many wonderful options. I am trying to change the conversation about what is defining success. This young generation of Americans really don't have any loyalty to going to an IBM or any company working with them for some period of time. They're happy to jump from place to place and be challenged with their skill set. We already know that our current retirement system is crushing itself under its own weight. We've got to find a way out of that and we've got to find a way to say, we value what you do while you serve, not how long you do it. And we should have an opportunity so that somebody will come in and serve for seven or eight years, can check out, go do something else, industry, start a family, get a PhD, do something else, and welcome them back in with no penalty and allow them to still work up and down on that escalator. This is the, the future challenge that I see in the next 10 years. And I think we're gonna have to have some serious conversation and we've gotta get through things like American Legion and VFWs who just believe that if you take that away from the American sailor, soldier, airman, marine, our nation will fail. And I've been saying this for 25 years. I care much more about the value of what you do while you're in uniform rather than how long you do it. Can we have, if anybody has one more short one, that's probably all we have time okay. for. Okay, one more. Short. Yes, sir. Uh, Admiral is an Air Force backseater flight test. Uh, thank you for the Naval Academy education. Uh, and I'm going to ask you a hard one. Yeah. In your upperclassmen, did you discuss at all the high turnover of flag officers in all services in the last five or six years, or do we wait for your numbers? The, the high turnover of flag officers for meaning that they're just leaving because they're not interested in staying or leaving because they have failures? Well, there's been a high turnover, hasn't there? Yeah. In the last six years. Um, I, I would tell you that uh, I don't talk to midshipmen about life as a flag officer. Uh, it's, it's, it's too early for them to be thinking about that. When, if I'm getting a small conversation, somebody would engage me in that, absolutely. Uh, that is conversation that in my last job I did have with the Chief of Naval Operations and the Secretary of the Navy, you know, the strategy of how do we keep uh, the right officers at all the different levels in the flag community. Um, you know, I, I will tell you just very upfront and honest, I mean, uh, I sign a piece of paper when I took over the Naval Academy that says that I retire when I'm done with this job. 
This is a new model that was started some years ago when Admiral Larson came in as a four-star to run the Naval Academy. And the idea was we don't want somebody going there that has visions of going somewhere else to take their eye off the ball. This is that important of a job. Uh, when I got asked to interview for this job, first of all, I didn't think I would get it, but boom, here I am. I took this as the ultimate highest calling that I could ever have in uniform because I am developing not just the next generation of leaders in the Navy and the Marine Corps, because I believe in that back end of the statement, I'm developing the future and next greatest generation of leaders, period. And I hope that they let me stay there a long time. You know, your typical Ivy League college president typically term, serves 10 to 20 years. Uh, we typically only serve three or four years. That's barely enough time to get something going. So I don't have a lot of time to make my impact, and uh, I don't let grass grow under my feet. So I will keep working it. But in terms of the future uh, of the, the flag community, uh, I would tell you that it's strong. For every one of me there is, there's 10 others that can replace me. There's a lot of talent out there. How long we keep them and how we decide who promotes to the flag ranks, uh, I would tell you we're still trying to figure that out. Anyway, thank you all very much. Really enjoyed uh, talking to you. Thank you. Just one small token of our uh, enduring relationship. Let's set this here. Thanks very much. Thank All right. Thanks, everybody.